thank you thank you very much for the thank you very much for the introduction Sevin. thank you everyone for attending the talk today today i will be presenting part of my um, phd work titled turbulence and drag reduction uh, over backswimmer textured surfaces i'd like to thank my supervisor Dr. Mehdi Sadegi and the uh, UK Turbulence Consortium for all the help and support. So when we talk about super hydrophobic texture surfaces, previous literature can be divided into four categories. The first one is simplistic, super hydrophobic, super hydrophobic with smooth surfaces and by applying arbitrary navier slip condition. To achieve drag reduction with this case, stream-wise slip length is required. This method was limited to low Reynolds number and does not capture texture geometry in three dimensions. Second, we have simplistic super hydrophobic surfaces with liquid only, where no slip and free slip boundary conditions are involved as shown here. This method has shown significant drag reduction for the past year at low Reynolds number, but it still can't capture 3D texture surfaces. The third category is super hydrophobic texture surfaces with uh, two fluids where the geometry is fully captured in three dimensions and where the, geom the changes in geometry and viscos uh, fluid viscosity significantly impact the obtained drag reduction. This method has been tested at low Reynolds number. However, the drag reduction obtained from this geometry was smaller than the ones achieved compared to the uh, to the second one. Biometric crablets and surfaces where textures are inspired by aerodynamically efficient creatures, example of which include but are not limited to the seal fur geometry, which exhibited a drag reduction of 12%, according to Ito et al, who also suggested that that drag performance was better than liblets. And the reason behind that was due to the minimum roughness effect associated with, with the use of this texture. However, with biometric texture surfaces, this is not always the case. For example, the herringbone bird feather had up to 73% drag increase when it was tested. And the shark denticles, real 3D shark denticles had 55% drag increase. For both cases, the complex shape of the structures was one of the reasons that resulted in the drag increase, where the mean flow was mainly dominated by secondary flow. So to get to our geometry inspired by the back swimmer, the back swimmer is also known as Notonecta glauca. It is an efficient aerodynamic insect, which can swim and dive quickly through water. It's capable of supporting itself underwater using the tip of its abdomen, capable of holding an air film for a long period of time. And recently, it was used to design a bio-inspired pressure sensing method by Menetial. Also, it has been mentioned in a number of literature in the fields of biology in particular as a potential drag reducing surface, particularly using those geometries shown here. So the aim of this objective is to investigate the effect of a novel implementation of a textured surface inspired by the back swimmer uh, through the following objectives. The first one is to understand the effect of the roughness texture of the back swimmer roughness texture on turbine flow behavior and channel flow. Then to understand the effect of changing Reynolds number and texture topology on the turbulent flow behavior. And finally, to understand the effect of a super hydrophobic texture implementation on the turbulent flow behavior, where the uh, viscosity is different above and below the roughness crest. For all the presented test cases, the channel consists of a bottom wall with back swimmer textured surface and a top smooth wall. For the super hydrophobic implementation, we consider the main fluid to have 100 times higher viscosity for the region above the roughness crest. Flat interface is considered, hence the deformation and, the associate, and its associated dynamics are not modeled. The density is assumed to be the same for both fluids and buoyancy is neglected. For all the presented simulations, the in-house direct 
numerical simulation code Shapsim is used. The governing equation is treated to solve different viscosities above and below the roughness crest. The, the viscosity mu is considered as a function of wall normal distance, where y is the wall normal distance uh, measured from the crest, and n is the viscosity ratio. The interface between two fluids is considered to be at y over delta equals minus one. To mimic a stable interface and flow with infinite surface tension, two further boundary conditions are enforced. One is that the wall normal velocity is considered to be zero at crest, and the viscous stress of the streamwise and spanwise velocity are enforced to be the continuous. This is done by revising the second order derivatives of the streamwise and spanwise velocities with respect to the wall normal distance at the first point next to the interface. The NH code space discretization is done using the second order finite difference method scheme. Viscous terms are solved using Crank Nicholson method, convection terms using third order Runge a Poisson equation using fast Fourier transformation, and the time advancement using fractional step method. The implementation of the geometry is done using the immersed boundary method, taking into account that the flow below the geometry is not necessarily set to zero. The um, parallelization of the code is done using hybrid MPI OpenMP. The back swimmer test cases can be divided as follows, as, as shown here. In terms of geometry changes, we varied the width to height ratio in the streamwise and spanwise direction between zero and two for a height of 3% at one Reynolds number equals 2800. Uh, for a Reynolds number case, we had one configuration where the width to height ratio in the streamwise direction was zero and the spanwise direction was two. And Reynolds number varied between 2800 to 7400. And for the super hydrophobic surface, we used the same configuration, zero and two, at 2800 and the viscosity ratio was 100 below at four, where mu two was above and mu, mu one was below the maximum geometry. The code in, for smooth channel cases, the code is validated against KMM data in terms of mean fluctuating velocities and vorticities and Reynolds shear stress. The computational domain, spatial and temporal resolutions are verified against this literature. We used the, the dimensions for all the test cases followed the minimal span channel proposed by uh, Chang et al. And a two point correlation plots were relaxed at zero for in the streamwise and in the spanwise direction. And for every back swimmer case, the back swimmer geometry was compared against the smooth case uh, at the same Reynolds number. The drag reduction was calculated by means of um, total drag, taking into account the roughness effects. As the number of roughness elements increase in the streamwise direction, negative drag, drag reduction reduces. As Reynolds number increases in the spanwise direction, it increases in the, uh, the, drag, the, the negative drag reduction increases. As Reynolds number increases, drag reduction in the negative Mm, negative drag reduction increases. However, for the super hydrophobic implementation, we achieved 42% drag reduction. The change in the spatial average velocity is shown here for test cases for the rough uh, implementation. In the streamwise direction, the log low intercept displacement decreased at the number of roughness elements increased in the streamwise direction, but the change wasn't significant as the number of roughness elements increased in the spanwise direction. At different Reynolds number, as Reynolds number increases, delta U plus value increased, and especially at higher Reynolds numbers, as you can see here, 50, 500, and 70, 400. The very, for the, the rough versus super hydrophobic implementation, mean velocity profiles are shown here. It is shown that the, uh, for the rough case, the plot coincides with the smooth case for the region beyond y plus equals 15. This is in agreement with the flow behavior over rough surface in the hydraulically uh, smooth region. However, significant upward shift for the case of the super hydrophobic implementation was achieved, which is associated with the 
reduced friction velocity for this case and is consistent with the obtained drag reduction. For U minus U crest, we can see at the fiscus layer, all uh, cases collapse with the, with the smooth case. This suggests that the mechanism of drag change for both the rough and the superhydrophobic implementation are similar. In terms of fluctuating velocity, for, for, yeah, root mean square of fluctuating velocities, we can see that for the region beyond y plus equals 10, there is an uh, agreement between the rough implementation and small and the rough and the rough back swimmer case. For the super hydrophobic case, there was a significant decrease in the profile compared to the corresponding smooth case. However, the cases are, there is an agreement compared to a smooth case, which has the same corresponding Reynolds, no, Reynolds tau, which is at 110. And as we can see here, there is a good agreement between uh, both cases. For rough and super hydrophobic cases, phase average and spatially average stream components um, are collapsing beyond the roughness height, which is at y plus equals four. The discrepancies are just within the roughness height, as we can see here, and it associated with the uh, dispersive um, stress effect, which is a result from the roughness effect. The turbulent uh, shear stress and viscous profile are shown here. It is shown that in the near world region, which is up to y plus equals 15, the rough and super hydrophobic profiles are similar. This indicates that the structure of the near wall turbulence for both rough and super hydrophobic cases, they do not change. And um, Arena set al proposed a relation for coloration of drag reduction with maximum wall normal Reynolds stress. The relation was derived based on results from super hydrophobic flows, uh, super hydrophobic flows over both square bars and cube configuration. As shown, it is noted here that the, our super hydrophobic back swimmer implementation shows good agreement with the proposed coloration. The root mean square of fluctuating vorticity is shown here for all the presented cases. It is seen that the vorticities of the rough case for, for the rough implementation collapse well with the smooth, uh, with, with the smooth with no changes, significant changes. In terms of the super hydrophobic implementation, we can see that there is a, sign a, a decrease in the a decrease in the plot compared to smooth case. This suggests that the vorti that this is the vortex for me happens at the vortex formation stage regeneration cycle. The wall normal and spanwise vorticities remain unchanged for the rough and the superhydrophobic case, which indicates that the back swimmer uh, effect on the small scale structures is less significant than the large scale structures. Visualizations of high, low, and negative lambda 2 are shown here for both the rough and the uh, uh, super hydrophobic implementation. As we can notice that the vertical structures for the super hydrophobic case are shorter than for the rough implementation case. In conclusion, we studied the back swimmer uh, turbulent flow using our in-house code SHAPSIM. For Reynolds number less than 3500, uh, 3, there was, the flow was comparable to uh, smooth channel flows with less than 3% drag increase. For the rough implementation between 3500 and 7400, there is a significant change in the turbulent behavior and it demonstrated a drag increase up to 28% for the case of 7400. The results suggest that small scale turbulent structures are less influenced by the presence of the back swimmer structures and find uh, outer layer similarity exhibited by uh, streamwise velocity fluctuations was as well noticed for super hydrophobic surfaces at Reynolds number equals 2800, 42% drag increase, uh, drag reduction was obtained. Uh, thank you very much. I look forward for your questions. Uh, thank you very much, Khalil, for your presentation. <clears throat> um, there is a question on the chat about your um, Immersive boundary method. 
Uh, can you tell us a little bit more? I mean, is there any reconstruction inside the object? So uh, the way we did uh, with the with the immersed boundary method is that we used a curve to digitize the geometry from the images that we got from Professor Bartlett in University of Bonn, and then we defined the first point away from the roughness based on the borders of the geometry. So we divided it into two upper and lower surface. And then we, we, we defined it. one of them was, I think, sixth order function, the other was a tenth order function. And that's how we captured the geometry, similar to the uh, schematic we had from an average approximation of that microstructure. Thank you very much. So uh, I see another question. It includes yes. pressure drag. OK, yes. it includes pressure drag. Yeah. So the question was, uh, are you talking about friction drag or friction drag and uh, pressure drag? So it includes pressure drag. Yeah, it's total drag. So it includes roughness effect and pressure drag. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. Uh, you. If, you, if you have more questions for Khaled, please uh, feel free to uh, use the chat. Uh, Khaled will monitor the, the chat, obviously. Um, thank you very much again. Um, we can move on to the second speaker today uh, from the University of Manchester, uh, Andrew Moll, who is going to talk about uh, embedded large eddy simulation. So, uh, Andrew, if you can share your screen. Wonderful. We can see your uh, screen. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, now we can hear you, yes. Great, thanks. Um, so yes, please go ahead. Uh, Andrew is working with uh, Alex Killen and Alistair Revel, and so this is going to be about uh, embedded large simulation. So please, uh, Andrew, you have like 15 minutes or so. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit about some of our, our recent work and, and developments on, on embedded large eddy simulation and particularly um, the uh, use of the synthetic eddy method within this. Um, so I'll talk a bit about the synthetic eddy method and, and embedded large eddy simulation um, and, and some drift terms that we include as well. Um, and then I'll talk about a number of different test cases that we've been looking at. Um, and I'll go into more details on those as we as they come up. So first of all, embedded large eddy simulation is a hybrid RANS LES um, model where we define a, a small region of LES within the RANS domain. Uh, where perhaps um, we know that the RANS model is, is not um, providing the necessary um, spatial or temporal resolution or um, where we know the RANS model is, has a particular failure, we can then apply the LES region um, in a kind of confined um, area within the domain. So the, the current work we've been doing is using a, a nested method. So the RANS domain covers the full domain and the LES domain is kind of placed on top of that um, and these two domains are run with separate solvers um, at the moment, both in, in open phone. And we've been using Precise to communicate between the two solvers to enable the coupling between the two. So when we are looking at embedded large early simulation, um, it becomes more of a, a boundary condition problem within the LES. So we need to define the, what we have at the boundaries for, these, uh, for the LES domain. So at the inlet, um, we need to take the the um, uh, RANS um, data and produce kind of fluctuating velocity that is needed for the LES at the inlet. Um, and then at the outlet, we need to couple back from the LES and, and transfer that data to the RANS um, and just trying to kind of correct what might be happening in the RANS to what we're seeing in the LES. So the synthetic eddy method um, is what we use to generate this fluctuating velocity field at the inlet. Um, and so we define a, a, a collection of um, uh, eddy structures, um, as you see on the bottom here. Um, and these are superimposed upon the mean flow um, that we're getting for the RANS. And we can then control the, the, the size and the shape and, and the strength of these um, eddy structures in order to match um, the turbulent statistics that we're getting from the RANS as well. So you we can match the mean flow and the, the turbulent statistics of the RANS um, by using the synthetic eddy method and generate that fluctuating velocity field. 
And so the, the fluctuating velocity field is, is a, a sum of the contributions of the separate eddies on, on that one point. Um, and we then um, scale this with the Lund matrix to match the Reynolds statistics or Reynolds stresses, um, the turbulent statistics that we're getting from the RANDs um, and add that onto the, the mean velocity from the RANDs as well um, to get our, our full fluctuating um, velocity field at the inlet. And then at the outlet, um, we introduce these, these drift terms into the RANDs. So a source term in the, in the RANDs equations in, in order to kind of uh, nudge the, the solution that we're getting in the RANDs um, towards the solution that we're getting in, in the LES. So we do this in a region near the, near the outlet. Um, I'm green here. So we do this both in the momentum term and the turbulent kinetic energy at the moment. Um, and, and we have a time relaxation based on the Reynolds statistics. So we've looked at uh, a number of um, test cases. Um, so um, what we've been trying to do is develop this embedded large eddy simulation. So kind of towards a, a point where it can be used in industrial cases. So it needs to um, be able to deal with um, a number of different things. So firstly, we looked at a turbulent boundary layer. So this is to, to look at um, the flow in, in external cases. So it's been, the synthetic eddy method has been used quite extensively in, in internal cases and in channel flows and pipe flows. We wanted to um, kind of validate its use in, in external cases and look at the, the length scale definition that we use um, in that region. We then look at uh, vortex generators within the boundary layer. So for an extension of the turbine boundary layer, um, we introduce kind of a, a three-dimensional flow um, rather than just a, a, a two-dimensional um, profile with these, these vortices being introduced. We also look at uh, pulsating channel flow. So we now have a, a time varying um, uh, RANS calculation um, and then matching the the LES inflow data to that, that time varying um, uh, kind of average um, RANS or average time varying. So we're, we're capturing that, um, that variance. We've also looked at um, tandem wall mounted cubes, um, and this poses some, some more um, kind of industrially relevant problems that occur. So, particularly with the recirculation regions. Um, if we define a, uh, a plane in a recirculation region, how does that affect what's going on? Um, and then we've also looked at a Formula One front wing case. So switching from, from RANS to LES um, after the front wing to kind of capture the, the vortices that are being produced um, in this region. So to start with, for the turbulent boundary layer, you can see we have a, a large RANS domain with the boundary layer developing along its length. Um, and then we start the LES calculation, uh, Reynolds number of 3040, based on the, the momentum thickness. Um, and so at this inlet, we then define the, uh, the fluctuating velocity using the synthetic eddy method. And this is propagated along the length of the LES domain. When we plot the coefficient of friction, along the wall in the LES domain, you can see we have an initial drop in the coefficient of friction. Um, and this is associated with a, a recovery length um, as the, um, the fluctuations move from a kind of synthetic, uh, synthetic eddies to a more realistic turbulent structure. We get this, this, this drop in a, in a recovery. And by, um, modifying the, the, the definition of the length scale to one that, that has anastropic eddies, so that they are um, uh, throughout the domain, they, they're defined based on the real statistics of the RANs to, to um, be shaped um, more realistically. We managed to shorten this recovery length um, quite considerably. So down to a, about uh, five or six um, boundary layer thicknesses downstream of the inlet, we have kind of recovered this 
coefficient of friction. We then introduced the vortices. So on top of the, the Rand's boundary layer, we then applied a, uh, a bachelor vortex model. Um, so with the azimuthal and, and um, axial velocities defined um, as, a, as a bachelor vortex, and a combination of, of different vortices could then be um, superimposed upon the boundary layer before the synthetic eddy method is applied to kind of um, investigate more of the three-dimensional um, uh, inlet profile. You can see here, again, the LES domain um, uh, within a, a larger RAND boundary layer. Um, and you can see at the inlet how the, the um, eddy structures are being generated and are interacting with the, the mean uh, vorticity um, structures we have. So here we have a common flow down vortex pair um, that are pulling the vortices round um, and uh, flatten, flattening the boundary layer between them. We compared our data so to some uh, reference LES, uh, a reference LES case and, and an experimental case, um, and we got quite good agreement. So you can see here the, the peak vorticity along the length. Um, we match quite well to the, the previous LES studies um, of this. And the um, resolved Reynolds shear stresses are shown here as well. And again, we're matching these um, at a, a point of 15 uh, boundary layer thicknesses downstream of the inlet. We're matching uh, the profiles of these um, quite nicely. So showing that the, the, um, the method is working quite well in this case, with the three-dimensional inlet. And because we were using a bachelor vortex model at this inlet, rather than resolving the, the, the vortex generators upstream, um, we were able to modify this very easily and investigate a range of different vortex configurations. So we looked at counter-rotating and co-rotating vortex pairs, as you can see here, um, and uh, also skewed the counter-rotating vortex pairs with, with different um, vortex strengths for each one. Um, and we're able to look at um, a wide number of cases where we, we varied the, the separation distance um, as well. Um, so this is um, work that we're currently um, finishing writing up at the moment. Because we were using LES um, to, to look at this in, uh, in this region, we were able to also look at um, the anastropy of the, the structures um, uh, within the vortices or within the boundary layer and affected by the vortices. So you can see here the, the red correlates to kind of uh, one component turbulence, so kind of um, long pencil-like structures. Um, the green is, is, is flat structures, so two components, so like a plate-like structures and, and blue um, isotropic or spherical structures. And you can see how um, the vortices are affecting these structures as they're being um, uh, pulled around the, the vortex um, from the um, boundary layer. So we also moved on to look at um, time varying inlet data for the, for the SEM. And so to do this, we used the pulsating channel flow where we have a, a, a sinusoidal uh, function of the velocity of the mean velocity flow um, with a, an amplitude of 20% of, of, the, of the mean um, and uh, a period of two seconds. And you can see here with the, the large RANS region and that small LES region embedded within that, um, that the synthetic eddy method is updating with time to um, match the, the mean flow that we're getting at this um, at this point. So you can see here the, the LES, in, so this is at this inlet um, location. The velocity profile here, the LES is, is matching the, the RANS um, at this location and the same for the uh, turbulent statistics. So here the, the shear stress. 
we've also started to look at um, applying the drift terms in this in this case. So um, uh, forcing the the rands towards the LES um, in this second half of the LES region, um, and you can see how if we take the profile here, um, the um, the velocity and the and the turbulent kinetic energy um, are being forced um, within this region here to match the LES. So we're, we're transferring data um, from the RANS to the LES at the inlet and then back to the RANS again at, towards the outlet. So we can kind of um, hopefully in more complex cases um, improve our, our, our RANS downstream of the LES. We also looked at um, the, the tandem cubes, so wall-mounted tandem cubes. And this was to, to start looking at um, this recirculation region. So you can see here, around the first cube, we get this large recirculation region. And if we're to um, have a, uh, a small LES domain, it may be that we need to have a domain that crosses this boundary. So if we're having a, a an inlet to the LES defined along this boundary. We then need to um, introduce the SEM only where we have an inflow and, and turn it off where we have the outflow and allow for this outflow. So this is something we're, we're testing at the moment on this case, going from RANS to LES. And then also looking at going from LES to RANS, we've applied a forcing region here. So we have, uh, the full domain in RANS and then the LES just around the first cube here. And then we're forcing the turbulent kinetic energy and the, and the, um, the velocity, but here we're showing the, the turbulent kinetic energy because it's a bit clearer. Um, so you can see how we're matching the, the, the turbulent kinetic energy in this region um, in the RANS to that that we're getting in the LES. And finally, um, we've started applying this to, to more complex um, industrially relevant flows. So in this case, um, is a, uh, a simplified Formula One front wing with the um, vortices being reduced off the end plate here. Um, and we're switching between RANS and LES and RANS um, downstream of the, the, the front wing to be able to capture the interaction of the vortices. So this is work that's um, ongoing at the moment. So in conclusion, um, we've been applying the ELES and synthetic eddy method to increasingly complex flows. Um, so with secondary mean velocity components, um, with unsteady RANs, um, within recirculating regions, um, and on industrially relevant complex flow. If you've got any questions, I'm happy to. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Very nice. Uh, presentation with very nice movies. Uh, there's uh, one question on the chat, or two questions actually. Um, so the uh, it's a question from uh, Bruno Fraga, and it's uh, to which degree is the translation of run statistics to uh, SEM automatized? So in this this current work, it's um, the two solvers are run concurrently, so they run at the same time, and the the data is transferred. Um, using a precise that's coupled, so they're running at the same time, and the the velocity and the uh, Reynolds stresses are taken from the RANs and passed to the LES. Um, uh, so very automatically. In case. Okay, and the second question is: um, any insights on the sensitivity of the method to the relevant Reynolds number? So yeah. Yeah, so I think there there is some sensitivity with the synthetic A method to the, the Reynolds number, um, particularly with the development length um, of the um, that we, that you see downstream of the inlet. Um, and I think so. The the higher the, the Reynolds number, you get more it kind of shortens that um, development region because there's less need for or it kind of generates itself this, these um, turbulent structures more easily. So it's where you have much lower Reynolds number that, that becomes more sensitive to, to the inlet data that you're providing. 
Great. Um, thank you very much, Andrew, uh, for your presentation. And of course, if you have some questions from Andrew, please feel free to uh, use uh, the chat. All right. Um, we are going to move on to the last uh, talk, not the last, uh, the last scientific talk, I will say, uh, from the University of uh, Sheffield with uh, Mathieu Falcone. So, Mathieu, if you can share your screen and unmute yourself. So can we you can, hear me? Yes, we can see your screen and we can hear you. Oh, nice. Thank you very much. So, um, the last scientific talk for today uh, from the University of Sheffield uh, is about uh, accelerating turbulent uh, flow with longitudinally moving walls. So please, Mathieu, you have about 15 minutes. All right, uh, uh, thank you. And I'd like to thank all the other um, talks today as well. Um, uh, this talk is about what I've been doing in the um, first part of my PhD. And this has been looking at spatially accelerating turbulent flows and using a kind of a novel approach to trying to simulate these so that you can try and improve the understanding of the fundamentals of these flows. So I'm going to start with an, like an overview of the presentation. So I'm going to be starting with an introduction, a little bit about spatial acceleration, why it's relevant, and also some of the key features of these flows. And then I'll be discussing this um, kind of new approach to um, simulating these flows. And then I'll be discussing the results and proposing a kind of new theory to try and explain the development of the flows. So um, first of all, kind of what is spatial acceleration? So um, this broadly speaking occurs when the streamlines velocity increases with downstream distance. And for subsonic flows, um, it is typically imposed by reducing the effective flow area. Um, spatial acceleration is relevant in a, a range of engineering applications. So for example, in an aircraft, um, the control surface and the wings at various stages in, in flight will um, experience varying degrees of, uh, of spatial acceleration. But um, beyond that, it's also of theoretical interest because you have some phenomena such as laminarization that occurs when a flow is accelerated severely. Um, I will briefly discuss um, a bit more about um, laminarization and spatial accelerating flows. Um, this is where much of the research has focused on when it comes to these flows. And kind of figure three here kind of, I guess, um, kind of highlights the, the development that tends to happen here. So if you look at like the right image here, you can see, uh, uh, you can see, you know, you initially have a lot of um, presence of a lot of vortices. And as you go um, downstream, the, the density of the vortices become less before you end up with um, a kind of recovery after that. And that kind of highlights um, or some, sometimes discussed as like the kind of four stage development of laminarization. So um, you start with um, kind of fully developed turbulence before going into reverse transition. And then you have quasi lamina and then retransition. And what is um, interesting about these flows is that unlike some other forms of laminarization, the, you don't, it's not really characterized by the destruction of the, the turbulent structure, the turbulent um, stresses. And even in, in, a quasi, in the quasi lamina section, you still have and significant underlying structures that are often highly perturbed by the presence of the acceleration. And from here, I will discuss the, the methodology. So using the moving wall to impose the acceleration. Um, so I think it's a good place to start is to look at how a spatial acceleration is typically imposed. Um, and as I said, it's done by reducing the flow area. And you might do this sort of by having an initial channel flow and then kind of sloping the wall and this gives you that reduction in flow area that leads to your spatial acceleration. Um, but the, the development of these flows is complicated um, and, um, and particularly with the presence of this sloping wall, um, you get this contraction of the streamlines, you get a redirection of flow towards the bottom wall. And therefore it was deemed that actually at first analyzing a kind of more simple flow um, and then trying to understand that flow and then, try, and then going from there to understanding a more typical spatial acceleration would be a good approach to do this. And that um, the way that this was done by was by essentially starting with a, a channel flow and then modifying the streamlines velocity boundary conditions. So this would be done by, so at the onset of the acceleration, so the kind of first dashed line here, um, you, um, you, you modify the wall velocity so it becomes increasingly negative. And because you have a channel flow, the absolute velocity doesn't change and therefore 
you know, you know, the fluid relative to the wall and accelerates as you go downstream. So we have a, a relative acceleration. And this was implemented into the DNS of Chapsim. And in this case that I will be presenting, it had an initial Reynolds number based on the half channel height of 2,800. Um, so now we can move on to some of the results. So I'll be starting with an, some in, instantaneous results and then proposing an idea to explain that development and then um, showing some more statistical development as well. And, and I'll start that by um, playing a video. So um, you should be able to see four um, figures here. So if we look at that kind of first, first figure, we've got the relative volt velocity. And we can see in this case that um, the velocity increases from one to two linearly over uh, 15 chan half channel heights. And that if we look at the skin friction coefficient below that, we can see how the, um, the skin friction coefficient um, in that initial stage, so before that red line, um, we can see the, the skin friction coefficient dropping to a minimum. And actually the red line here, and also the vertical lines in the subsequent plots represent that minimum in that skin friction coefficient. Mm -hmm. right. And then at this point, the skin friction coefficient begins to recover to um, its kind of steady it's state balance. Um, um, and then, um, so the, the, key the key plots from this one are the third and fourth plots. So these show the streamwise um, velocity fluctuation and the wall normal velocity fluctuation. And this shows a kind of a plane parallel to the bottom wall at around y plus equals five. And if we look at the start of that third plot, the streamwise velocity fluctuation, we can see the kind of typical near wall streaky structures that we, that we may expect um, in, a, in a wall shear flow. And then after you get the start of the, this um, acceleration, you can start to see how the streaky structures begin to become intensified during this initial stage. And then as you get around this red line, around the minimum CF, you start to see the kind of the flow beginning to break down. Um, you start to get the formation of what appears to be kind of turbulent, turbulent, the formation of turbulent spots. And I think this is much more clearly observed if we look at the bottom plot. So we look at the normal velocity fluctuation and we can clearly see the kind of the formation of the turbulent spots here. Um, and I think the one thing that I'd really like to highlight here is if we look at the four th in, in this bottom plot before we get the, the formation of those turbulent spots, we actually find that the normal velocity fluctuation doesn't really respond much at all during this um, initial phase. Um, however, once we start to get the, the formation of those um, turbulent spots, we can see how they kind of are kind of convected downstream. And you can see how these spots tend to start spreading out until we get to this kind of final stage of the flow where the entire kind of wall surface seems to be covered in kind of new turbulent structures. Um, again, if we look at the, um, the, the streamwise velocity fluctuation, again, we can see how in this kind of middle section after the red line, um, we can see how the, the spots kind of coexist with those neural streaky structures. And we can also see in the skin friction coefficient, the, that increase is related to the increases in wall shear stress associated with the kind of newly development, developing turbulent structures that are present there. So having kind of briefly kind of overviewed how the flow develops in kind of instantaneous terms, I think it'll be useful to discuss the, the kind of the new idea related to the development of these flows. So, um, and that is, can be kind of summarized into kind of sentences. So firstly, is that the, on, the, on the onset of the acceleration, a new laminar boundary layer forms superimposed on the existing turbulent flow and that the development of the flow is then characterized by the development and subsequent transition of the boundary layer in a process somewhat similar to what you might find in bypass transition. And kind of similar to the development of bypass transition, the flow does appear to be able to be characterized into kind of three broad regions that or we have labeled pre-transition, transition, and then fully turbulent. So in that pre-transition phase, it's where you're getting the kind of the strengthening, the amplification of those near wall streaky structures. And then when you're starting to get the kind of breaking down of the flow, that's when you're entering this kind of transition section. And then you end up in this kind of, um, this fully turbulent section once all those spots have kind of grown and merged together and the whole kind of ball surface that you saw in the previous slide is covered in those new turbulent structures. Um, now I'd like to describe um, how this theory kind of explains that develop the development that we've seen there. So if we first of all look at the the kind of the strengthening of the streaks that we observed in the pre-transition section there, um, and that is caused by the as this new boundary layer develops on the onset of the acceleration, there is um, you have the shear related to the development of that boundary layer, and this kind of modulates the existing structures, 
and this results in the amplification of those those neural structures. Hence, you get these these structures kind of you know, growing in strength as they go downstream. And one of the key things that I mentioned in the previous slide is the fact that the normal velocity fluctuation does not respond until you're getting those formulation of those turbulent spots. Um, and that is and that is explained because of the the fact that the um, these, this component won't respond until you're actually beginning to get the transition of the new boundary layer and you're starting to get the breakdown of those, those streaks. And um, this hasn't actually been presented, but you can actually look at how those, those streaks evolve with time. And actually what you find is during the, towards the end of that pre-transition region where you have those strength and streaks, you tend to get these kind of streak collisions that are in many respects reminiscent of what you might see in studies of transition as well. It should also be noted that this theory is not specifically about laminarization, but it's about spatial acceleration in general. Um, and from this, I think it's useful to discuss some of the um, statistical development of these flows. So a useful place to start with something like this is the Reynolds stresses. So if we look at the, the maximum of the normal Reynolds stresses, uh, we can start, we can see the blue line here, which represents the streamwise Reynolds stress. You can quite clearly see that the Kind of the streamwise disturbance energy almost exhibits the near linear growth during this period um, and this is associated with the strengthening of the streak so you're getting the the amplification you're getting the energy being extracted from the mean flow as this as these streaks are stretched um, and this results in that strengthening that we observe there um, also um, if you look at your um, at the other components you can see how you don't get that you, these do not respond until you get again to that vertical line um, around the, the, the minimum in CF, and that's when you're starting to get these streaks beginning to break down the formation of turbulent spots. On the right again, we can see the skin friction coefficient, slightly less stretched in this one, but you can see how the actual overall shape does somewhat resemble what you might, what you may see in transition as well. Um, now I'm just going to cover the, the Reynolds stresses a little bit more clearly, so actually showing the wall norm, their wall normal development and I will say that the, 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 blue, the blue ones in this slide and the next slide represent the, the kind of the streamwise locations before transition and the red ones depict those afterwards. And you can quite clearly see the streamwise growth in, in, that, in that case here as well. And I think it's perhaps clearer here than in the previous slide, but you can see how the normal Reynolds stress doesn't really respond at all until you start to get those, the formation of those turbulent spots. Um, I'd now like to cover the kind of the Reynolds shear stress. So what you can see in the first figure is the, is the development of the Reynolds shear stress. And you can see how um, this kind of, um, you get a kind of mild development in, the, um, in, in that initial phase. And actually what's quite interesting is if you look at the eddy viscosity, it doesn't respond at all. And that indicates that the increasing Reynolds shear stress is actually related to the, the increasing mean shear associated with the, the acceleration and that and that new boundary layer. Um, and this kind of, kind of emphasizes the kind of laminar-like response of the flow to that acceleration. And then it's only once you get the, the formation of those new term structures, you actually see the eddy viscosity beginning to respond at that point. Um, I've got a few more um, images that I would uh, like to present. So um, um, on the left here, we have the streamwise um, Reynolds stress budget. So, we can see the production and the pressure strain term here. And what you can see here is that the, um, the production increases from the onset of the acceleration. And that is, you can link that to the idea of the energy being extracted from the mean flow um, during that initial, initial phase and strengthening those streaks. However, streaks, however, if you look at the pressure strain, for example, um, you can see how that doesn't really respond at all. And that is kind of consistent with the, the idea of the, the kind of the um, the non-streamwise components not really responding until you get that, um, until you start getting those turbulent spots forming. Um, then if we look at figure 15, we can see the spanwise autocorrelation of the streamwise velocity. And you can see that if you look at, if you compare x equals three, so that top right figure to the, the x equals zero, so the top left figure, you can see that the minimum there quite clearly intensifies. And that is consistent with the idea of the streak strengthening during that pre-transition period. Um, and then um, if you look at the plot below it, so if x equals nine, you can see how this is during that transition phase and you can see how that minimum has faded substantially. So that is consistent with the idea of the, the streaks breaking down and the formation of turbulent spots at that point. And at that point, I would like to um, conclude. So 
in, in, in summary, so a, a new theory has been proposed to explain the development of spatial accelerating flows and that a, a new kind of approach has been, has been used to try to understand like an idealized spatial accelerating flow. Um, and the theory has actually been found to explain this development quite well, although this, I should mention, this is the, the kind of the first stage in this project and actually looking at more conventional spatial acceleration and how these ideas can be applied there. Um, will be an important aspect of the remainder of my PhD and also looking at further analysis of these flows as well. And I'd like to conclude by just like thanking, I uh, have some acknowledgements and uh, thanking um, the UK Terms Consortium particularly for the amount of compute time on Archer and Archer 2. So yeah, and thank you all for listening as well. Thank you very much, Matthew, for a very nice uh, presentation. Yeah. Uh, Actually, I don't see any question on the chat, but I have some questions. My, my first question is, so you are going for a linear increase of the velocity? As a, uh, in as this a, case, yes, it would be, it, it is a linear, but you can apply other ones to that. So you can like play, for example, like tan H curves to get a more gradual acceleration. In there as well. And so my question, I was wondering how, so you, you have a new uh, theoretical framework to explain what's going on and, uh, do, have you noticed any differences when you have uh, like a different type of uh, acceleration? In, in this case, you don't get huge amounts of difference. Um, you, um, you do, you obviously, you kind of like, you find that the decrease, for example, the skin friction coefficient, you do kind of get a decrease much more, like it's a much more steady decrease, but in terms of what tends to happen, not much change. The, the point of transition, if you compare two similar cases, doesn't change all that much in this case. Very yeah. good. And I have another question I've noticed. So when at the end of the acceleration, when the velocity stop accelerating and uh, become constant, yeah. there is a massive jump in the in the skin friction. Yeah, the, um, I and think. Do you have any idea why is that? I'm not necessarily 100% sure, but I think it's because when you have, I think it is partly related by having a, such a sudden change. I think you have the kind of, I guess, the... I'd have to think about it a bit more. Like I have thought about it, but I haven't. I can't necessarily articulate it quite well in terms of yeah, how, yeah. I, how, how I actually think about it. But I think the sudden change might mean that kind of. Yeah, I can't necessarily explain it articulately. I don't think. Um, yeah. I was wondering because when you start accelerating, you have a small, uh, a, a small jump of some sort. But yeah, it's quite the, the, small, that, that whereas... jump is. That jump there is you can kind of relate to the fact that because you're suddenly accelerating the flow, you yeah. kind of have the the flow kind of goes along and then you're suddenly moving the wall. So that kind of does cause a jump there. At the end, it could be like a kind of similar phenomenon, the fact that you're suddenly stopping it. So it could be related to that. You wouldn't get the jump in, in a gradual case, though, I should say. Great. And my final very small question, I was wondering how you do your normalization when you are doing some comparison uh, like before. Uh, during and after the, uh, are you normalizing with the local uh, so, Utah or you are uh, using the no, same Utah so forever? In this case, it's actually shown in absolute terms. I often find, particularly with this one, um, you often, if you present it, and actually I think you see this a lot in previous studies of spatial acceleration as well, is when you normalize locally, it actually hides this development. So okay. I think it's actually quite useful to show the overall development as well. Very good. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mathieu, for, um, for this. Okay, thank uh, well, thank you very much for all the speakers today. It was uh, three very nice uh, presentations. I hope everyone uh, enjoyed um, uh, watching them. Right, so I'm going to stop.